as everyone has been pointing out for the last hour and a half, we're running low on time, so we've decided to cancel lunch. And uh, <laughs> thank you. That was a joke, thank you. Alternatively, we're asking everyone to, uh, to be very concise and to the point in their comments. This, this uh, session, um, there's a lot of what's happening at this particular GEC is talking about plans for transition, and there's two kinds of, plan two kinds of things that we're transitioning. One is, is issues of governance and planning, and we're going to be talking about that in the session later this afternoon. But there's also some things that the GPO does now that um, there's been a, uh, a contract award for Genie going forward, the GGF solicitation, that represents some things that are being uh, transitioned now in the next year, year and a half, functions that the GPO has been doing that we're handing off to different organizations. And this session is for representatives of those organizations to stand up and be the, the face of those functions and saying, you know, we're going to be doing those things and, uh, and talk about them and, and hopefully very briefly and concisely. So uh, we want uh, each of these groups to be talking about the scope of the award, the, new, the responsibilities that, that they're going to be taking on, and, and the time frame and the nature of the transition. So this is the order. Uh, I, I know Jay is not here. I haven't seen Russ. Is Russ here? Oh, okay. So this is the order, so please sort of notice who you're before so you can sort of come right up and, uh, and go. Uh, this is not everybody who won a Genie Going Forward Award, but it's everyone who sort of directly reflects transition of, GP, of GPO function, uh, functionality of the community. So the, uh, the first person is Ilya. Sorry, I'll just have to present. Light's huge anyways. Um, so the tasks that we have really are the tasks that we're already doing, coordinating software updates, supporting and maintaining Exogenie software baseline. So we just did a release in January 2016 with some bug fixes for Genie stitching and the dynamic slice capability that Paul has shown. Um, we're supporting operational forensics and emergency shutdown. We've had, <coughs> we get about a one incident a month that's reported to us that we need to act on. Uh, usually it's a DDoS attack launched at somebody from a slice. So patch your images. Remember with Exogenie, it's bring your own image. We don't control the images you have. We don't know where they come from. It's your responsibility. Our response when somebody complains is very swift, and that's to shut the experiment down. So, because we have to. Um, explore and prototype concepts for software-defined exchange SDX. This is a very um, opaque bullet in our, uh, in our um, uh, statement of work, but Basically, to that extent, we are actually running a multi-point VLAN SDX that also um, Paul showed. It's at our uh, Brawley uh, point of presence where uh, um, our network, Ben, and Internet2 and some other networks kind of combine. Um, maintain the data store. This is the part where I think we're lagging behind. We've tried installing the software, and it caused us some problems. We've turned it off for a while. We're getting ready to uh, turn it back on once the time permits again. So, uh, configuring, testing new Exogenia racks. There are new racks. There's a new rack at Siena Ottawa uh, headquarters that was brought up for SC15. Um, uh, there's another going to be at, at Hanover. Uh, there's a rack we're bringing up at UNF, University of Northern Florida, and in, uh, in uh, Catholic University of Peru. Um, Genie going for, okay. Um, we're also supposed to respond to operational issues, and I think if, if, as, if you know us, if you tried using Exogeny, you know that we do. We have a mailing list, uh, geniorcausersgroups.google.com. Um, usually issues get escalated there from Genie users, but if you're, if you're an active Exogeny user, we inc encourage you to subscribe to this list. Um, the reporting on it is a lot faster. Um, we did a survey uh, of our users. Uh, we sent about 480 requests and, respond, and about 10% uh, of the users responded. So uh, we maintain a wiki with the address there, and uh, about 60% of the users said they knew where it was and it was useful, so that was gratifying. Uh, about 25% said they had no idea where it was, so hopefully now they do, because that was the question, that was the way the question was uh, posed in the survey. Uh, another question we asked, and, and Frida uh, had mentioned Exoblog, um, so we have a blog where we uh, show interesting advanced user uses of Exogeny. It's written by usually our staff, although we take contributions. So if you think something is cool um, that you've done with Exogeny um, deserves being published, send us a write-up. We'll be happy to post it. Uh, 
That one was a bit more discouraging. About 60% said they had no idea where it was. Although the one, you know, at the same time, about 35% said that they knew where it was and it was good. Um, we have quite a few hits on different articles. Um, Victor, he just raised his hands. Um, his uh, his uh, uh, entry, Lies, Damn Lies, and iPerf on high bandwidth experiments with Exogenie is just like total uh, leader. Um, enabling SiteAware, um, uh, uh, it was enabling SiteAware, what? Do you guys remember what enabling SiteAware what? Spark? I think it was enable SiteAware streaming analysis on Exogeny was another very popular article. Hadoop tutorial, as you can see. Uh, example, post boot scripts, Docker, um, creating custom images, and then there's kind of a long tail of things that people uh, might be reading, but maybe they're not all that relevant. Anyway, that's all I have. Great. Thanks, Ilya. Apologies. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Ann Chitwood, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Global NOC at Indiana University. Not to conf be confused with the University of Indiana, which is, which is in Pennsylvania, I think. Um, we provide, <laughs> that's all right. Absolutely not. So as I said, we're located at Indiana University. We provide 24 by 7, 365 tier one service desk support. Um, for the um, Genie community, we um, are providing notifications and reporting and escalation for the integrated Genie OpenFlow backbone network, as well as providing Genie experimenters information on the overall health of Genie. Um, we're the single point of contact for reporting trouble and connecting the Genie experimenters with the proper Genie operators. Um, some of the things that we are responsible for is the LLR process. So that's um, if we got a request from um, law enforcement for information, we would coordinate um, that response. Um, we also are responsible for the emergency stop. Um, emergency stop is a system that is used to respond to incidents of interference of resources. Um, caused either unintentionally or um, intentionally. So a denial of service attack would certainly fall in that area. Um, we test these um, processes on an annual basis and um, our last two tests were um, completely successful. We also provide outage maintenance and tutorial notifications. Um, so anything that would be disruptive, um, we would try to notify on that. Um, the Global NOC is also the NOC for Internet 2, and we work closely with um, the GMOC staff to provide clarification and manage requests between um, the two groups. Um, when a customer contacts um, the GMOC via email, um, it goes directly into a ticket, and um, that ticket will immediately be um, flagged for review by our staff. Um, we also have standing maintenance windows that are created in advance. Um, um, for the Genie portal and for Insigenie racks. Um, the stitching computational service was um, implemented last year, developed by Max um, and ran by Internet2, and we support that as well in the Global NOC. Um, as you can see, um, in the last year, um, Genie's transitioned mostly from turnips um, to a more standard day-to-day -day operation um, support model. 98% of the tickets that we get right now are for outages or maintenances or problem requests, not for turnips um, or um, provisioning um, issues. Going forward, our um, role is to um, work with GPO to um, transition operations, um, document everything um, that we have, processes and procedures. We're also going to be working with the folks at Kentucky to see if we can get the monitoring data that they've been able to um, put together and incorporated into our um, system so that we would see that um, as alerts in our notification system and be able to um, react as well. So I've got my contact information up there. Um, we're always available 24 by 7, like I said. So if there's ever an issue that you um, need to contact us of, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks a lot, Marianne. Okay. Jim Griffin is next. 
All right, so my name is Jim Grafune, and uh, I'm at the University of Kentucky. And so um, we're going to tell you a little bit about some of the, the GGF uh, work that we're going to be doing. Um, I'm doing this uh, jointly with Cody Bumgardner, also at the University of Kentucky. And we're uh, leading a, a team of folks who are going to be taking over some of the operations support. Uh, much of this work that uh, used to be done either at the GPO or at Utah, um, we're going to be taking on some of these uh, challenges moving forward. So. Um, first of all, basically, many of you maybe already know that we've been doing a lot of work in the area of experiments, experimenter tools, uh, particularly the Genie desktop. Uh, we'll continue to uh, run and operate those particular tools. So we've also been doing a lot of work in terms of basic monitoring of the underlying infrastructure and ensuring that the, the data that's being produced by the various racks is collected and analyzed. Um, we're going to continue to do that, and we've also been slowly taking over management and operations of the Instagenie racks. Um, I'm not going to actually talk too much about the Instagenie racks here. They had asked us to sort of give you some idea of where to turn if you have problems. Uh, much of the work that we actually do in terms of monitoring and keeping track of the Instagenie racks, uh, we exchange on sort of a, the ops mailing list, and there's a variety of people that are interested, and you can, of course, uh, sort of um, um, keep track of that if you need to. But um, in general, uh, the things that may be more of importance to you, I'll talk a little bit, are the sort of the operations and the, um, the tools that are out there. And obviously, we're also trying to put out some information there about uh, um, experiences, documentation, and uh, we're also sort of participating in some of the planning operations for what happens after uh, 2017. So um, in terms of operations monitoring, I'm going to actually keep this somewhat brief, but I would actually encourage you to come tomorrow morning where we're going to have a much bigger uh, presentation on the monitoring operations that are going on, some of the new features that have been um, created by Cody and his group. Uh, so basically, they've been pulling information from all the racks, and they're now making this available to you. And it's very easy for you to keep track of what's going on on the various racks, who's using, who's using, which links are being used, which ones are up and down. Um, they made mention to that earlier this morning. Um, in addition to that, there's some alerting and reporting functions that we're making available, and as uh, issues arise, we would escalate them to the appropriate places. And then also, we're trying to create monitoring reports uh, that we would uh, create periodically. So in addition to that, um, we are also now beginning to take over operations of some of the other services. This is something that's going to occur over the next year. It's occurring slowly. Um, in particular, we're beginning to more migrate the uh, Genie portal, which has been run by the GPO, the clearinghouse, and the um, identity provider services that have been operated by the GPO. We're going to slowly move, migrate them into uh, uh, AWS cloud services, where we will sort of take over operations of them. Um, in terms of actually getting accounts and that sort of thing, uh, all of those decisions about who gets accounts will still be reside with the GPO. Uh, we'll just be sort of operating the services uh, on their behalf. Uh, and as I said, this will occur gradually over the next year. Um, in addition to that, we'll continue to support the Genie desktop, and uh, we continue to have more and more users that are using the Genie desktop, and we'll be adding new functionality. One of the areas that we see a lot of new functionality or, and needs being is in the area of supporting open flow and basic SDN type uh, experiments, and so we've actually been building out some of our adopted Genie work. Uh, if you're interested in that, we can uh, tell you about some of that at our demo tonight. Uh, and we've also been adding in ways to interact with different types of controllers. So if you're writing applications that need to use different types of SDN controllers, uh, we have done some work there to help, your, help it and make it a little easier for you. Um, we're also looking for ways to integrate the Genie desktop with other applications and other tools, and we're slowly starting to <coughs> begin to in integrate that. And another area that we've really been added a lot of new things is in the area of scripting. So if you actually would like to make use of the Genie desktop functionality and the modules, we now have scripting interfaces that would allow you to uh, make uh, REST-based API calls and invoke some of those services directly from your application. So again, I would encourage you to come to our demo tonight where we can actually show you some of those features. All right, so that's it. Great, thanks, Jim. Rob Ritchie's next. Um, so I don't have slides because my uh, uh, um, our, our role is very simple. So uh, the as Jim mentioned, the University of Kentucky has been taking over a bunch of the kind of frontline uh, management for uh, and, and operations for the Instagenie racks, and we are basically going to 
subcontract with them to be kind of the escalation service. So when you know they need help with uh, software bugs, or uh, you know if there are, if there are places where we need to uh, you know provide a little bit of extra expertise or whatever uh, for the software that's on the Instagenia racks, um, or to or to do any bug fixes or that kind of stuff, um, they will they will escalate that kind of stuff to us. Great, thanks a lot, Rob. So I was going to talk a little bit about some uh, changes from the Internet 2 side and also what our role will be, um, both of which I think are relevant. Um, and I'll try to keep this really quick and then talk at greater length during the, uh, the open flow uh, section um, for those of you who are interested. So just to point out two obvious things but are probably relevant. Um, the Internet 2 network since its inception as Abilene has undergone continuous growth and evolution. Uh, including re-architecting it every few years. Um, and 2016 is shaping up to be a year or another year of significant change. Um, but we've also been a strong partner with Genie since its inception, and we intend to continue and improve on that strong partnership in 2016. Um, a big part of what we'll be working on is uh, creating what we hope is a more agile and nimble uh, open flow environment um, for uh, researchers to be able to work in, um, but we also would like to continue the conversation about what the, uh, the research community needs from Internet2 going forward, um, as 2018 is an even bigger uh, network evolution stage for us, so um, we really would like your input and your feedback on what you're looking for. Um, specifically, um, my hope is that it all looks like it didn't change that much to you, but a lot is changing under the hood. Um, we want to align our network services portfolio with evolving community needs, um, develop some deeper partnerships, and provide leadership in the network services landscape. So what we have today, and I'm trying to do this quick, and I can go slower later, um, you know, the, the basis, you've heard a lot of talks with the mention, and we run this over AL2S. AL2S is our layer two service. We will continue to offer a layer two service. Uh, as we are currently architected, our layer two service is built on top of an SDN substrate, um, and that AL2S service is also used to provide the interconnections between our layer three services, uh, between our routers. And we have a multi-vendor environment of junipers and brocades. Um, and that's kind of what the network looks like. So um, what's changing? <laughs> Um, basically, we're going to modify the core of the network. Um, the, we will be removing the dependency on OpenFlow in the core, um, in part because we can't get the, um, got to be very careful how I say this, we want to move more quickly. <laughs> um, and certain vendors move faster than other vendors. And so we have twin goals here of providing the most stable, basic network that we can and creating an environment that is both agile enough for you to be able to iterate what you want to do and to um, create an environment going forward in which we can be more responsive to what, the, what your community needs are. So basically, we're going to create a core network that is MPLS-based uh, on Junipers um, and maintain our existing customer services. Basically, we're going for feature parity going forward. We're going to provide an overlay network that will support SDN capability. Uh, our hope is to simplify the architecture and increase visibility for planning purposes and uh, position us to be more innovative and responsive to the community as we plan for the 2018 major refresh. So I like this picture somebody drew on the left is sort of what we have today. On the right is what we're moving towards tomorrow. Um, so our hope is from a basic point of view, for those of you who just need Internet 2 for VLAN, Layer 2 VLANs across the core, um, they will we will continue to have that Layer 2 VLAN service, and we will figure out a way to offer it so it integrates just like you're used to having it today. Um, for those of you who want to be able to run your own controllers on the Internet 2 network, which you can do today, uh, we're trying to create an environment where we'll actually be able to deliver OpenFlow 1.3 features and additional features as time goes on. Um, and actually, because we're uh, sort of decoupling it from the production requirements, be able to move faster. Um, so basically, still 1.0 to start. We're going for feature parity, and then we'll go to right to 1.3. 
Um, and um, we want to use the experience of working with the Genie community over the next year and a half to basically evolve our plan for the feature mix, the future feature mix, I can't say that twice, um, and be able to support um, network research as well as discipline research needs across the core. So basically the transition plan is to bring up an SDN overlay platform, um, to bring up the new core and to migrate, and we're planning to do that over the course of 2016. Um, so this is, uh, I had to draw at least one picture, um, and then I promised to be done. Um, basically, you could imagine you have two different genie racks, and they would like, you would also like to be able to control the SDN overlay in the core. You could do that. Effectively, we'll map the, the paths between the SDN devices through the core, if all you care about is just getting your VLANs to connect your Genie racks together, that will just work straight across and we'll still preserve the aggregate manager and everything else. Um, so hopefully this isn't too shocking or scary. If it is, I probably didn't say it very well, I'm hoping. <laughs> um, but either way, you can. I don't wanna take too much time now, but we can have questions in the open flow session and you can ask all the details you want there or just grab me in the hall. That's great. Thanks a lot, Eric. Okay. Violet's up next. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, our Genie Going Forward project. This is uh, joint with Ibrahim uh, Mata at Boston University. Hopefully that will come back. <laughs> OK. So um, our goal, of course, is to continue and expand Genie's success as a platform for, for both research and education. And uh, we're doing that in a number of ways. The first is uh, through Genie Regional Workshops, which are replacing the Newcomers Day at uh, the Genie Engineering Conferences. Our first one this year was yesterday, and uh, we're planning three more uh, this year. Now, it doesn't mean we're organizing it. We're gonna help somebody else organize it. So really what we want is for you to volunteer and say, I wanna host one in my area, and you know, your geographical area, and we'll help you set it up and, and uh, help you recruit uh, tutorial leaders and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, so please uh, volunteer. We also have uh, CNERT, which is our workshop uh, on uh, using test beds. And this year we're super, super excited that it's co-located with Infocom. Um, but however, there is some discussion about should, should we co-locate with one conference, the same conference every year, or because Genie serves different communities, such as uh, systems and education, should we co-locate with different uh, conferences? There are pluses and minuses with each decision, and uh, we would really like to hear what you think we should do. Uh, Probably you've heard about Genie Nice. Uh, this is a community event. Um, and uh, there was one last fall. There's going to be another one next fall. And uh, again, if you have some suggestions about which, co which conferences we should co-locate with, uh, that would be great. We are open to your suggestions. And we're also going to organize uh, Maybe you've heard about uh, Genie's summer camps. We were thinking of having a summer camp and a winter camp, maybe a winter camp in a nice warm place. Uh, uh, so if you're interested to host a camp, again, we would like to, we don't want to just organize everything. We want to bring the community in and have the community participate in organizing so we can help you out uh, uh, planning and, and organizing such an event. Uh, some other things um, we're we're just pursuing perhaps other opportunities and venues that we can uh, add to this. You know, maybe some tutorials, maybe some birds of feather sessions, panels, demos, things like this at various conferences or other events. And uh, really, that's it. Um, I just wanted to say that soon we're going to be going for lunch, and we'll be walking over to the College Avenue Commons building. And because it's the desert, and a lot of you aren't used to the desert, we're going to be putting bottles of water in your hand before you walk out the door. And even if you think you don't need it, please take it. And please drink it. 
because it's dry here, and uh, and I don't want you like collapsing. So <laughs> so please just take the water, and uh, no no complaints. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Violet. Next is Joe Membretti. Thank you. Just. Uh, uh, a dozen buttons to be pushed. So uh, Russ and I are going to be talking about SDX as a very valuable uh, resource. Um, a particular focus of ours is large-scale science, SDXs and large-scale science. And I'm doing a shout out to the LEGO people, uh, the LIGO people who we've supported on networking, and they've just discovered gravitational waves, so they're getting a gold star. Uh, we uh, have this uh, Starlight facility. It has currently 34 100 gigabit per second connections, uh, plus 130 private networks. Uh, at any given time, we're supporting 18 to 20 um, national and international test beds. This is our SDX. Uh, this is the box uh, view, a bunch of servers, controllers, and other devices. Uh, but we connect to uh, a global facility. A question came up earlier, what about international? Uh, all of us are partners to this, the Global Lambda Integrated Facility. It's not a network, it's a global environment within which you can do customized networks, uh, including test beds. We do customization through um, our facility for specific Instageny projects and also Exagenie projects. Uh, with our international partners, um, we have provisioned in this SDX um, a global um, uh, SDN uh, open flow test bed with sites uh, around the world. Um, some of the sites we deal with uh, are in Japan. I was just there a couple weeks ago with uh, Aki Nakao. We're cooking up some cool things. We also work with um, a variety of other SDN uh, test beds. This is in Siberia and Canada. Um, we showcased a little bit of what an SDX could do at supercomputing with our friends at ESNet. We provisioned four 100 gigs uh, from the Starlight facility into the show floor in Austin, plus another 200 from Washington, D.C. Um, we segmented those and then put a bunch of experiments on them, including this one with Caltech. Um, we worked with the uh, high-end computing networking folks at the Goddard Space Flight Center to do end-to-end, -end, um, that is, uh, server with 100 gig NIC across the wide area to server with 100 gig NICs to show you can do end-to-end -end streams, individual streams at 100 gig, memory to memory, but also 96 gig disk-to-disk. Uh, -disk. And that, again, is for high-end science. Uh, we worked with the Naval Research Lab to show an SDX uh, technique for uh, remote uh, movable processing and uh, 100 gig, in fact, that was 200 gig coming from Washington. Worked with our friends uh, at Siena. Uh, that's a 100 gig test bed uh, that we link to uh, to show a variety of capabilities uh, for controlling large scale streams, including multi tenant 100 gig. We have interconnected our SDX in Chicago to one in Amsterdam. Uh, we are bringing up an SDX with our friends in Taiwan. Um, there's a bunch of SDXs uh, planned for um, uh, both Japan and uh, Europe. Uh, this is a testbed called Felix. Uh, we're working with the Open Cloud Consortium. Uh, this was a nice uh, demonstration, proof point of a case study for an SDX. Within an SDX, which is a large-scale virtual switch, you can create virtual switches. This is one we created for SDX bioinformatics on 100 gigabit uh, per second networks. Um, as a speaker from Kellemson mentioned earlier, there's extremely large data sets that have to be uh, carefully controlled and sent. We're doing this on 100 gigabit with a variety of uh, folks around the world. Uh, this is a showcase that we did uh, several times last year. This project has now been joined by some partners in Taiwan, Academia Sinica, and Singapore. Um, we're working with the Chameleon um, uh, testbed uh, for clouds. If you have a Genie account, you can now have resources on Chameleon. Uh, if you have a Chameleon account, you can have resources on Genie. Uh, Russ is uh, in this picture, SOX. Um, there's a bunch of SDXs coming up. The IRNC program of the NSF has uh, funded SDXs in Sunnyvale, Los Angeles, um, Seattle, at Starlight. 
Uh, Tom Lehman, who spoke earlier, uh, is putting one up in Max. Uh, there's an IRNC, uh, SDX, and Ampath. We're going to mesh these together and tie them up around the world. So with that, I'll hand it over to Russ. Yeah, I knew better than to try to uh, compete with Joe's slides. Um, so, uh, and, and since he included uh, references to uh, the SOX and, and Amlight projects uh, as well. Um, so as part of the Gini going forward, um, we're continuing, obviously, this important work around SDX. Uh, what is SDX? What is SDX? What does it mean to enable SDX for the Gini community so that researchers can actually uh, you know, allocate an SDX as part of their project and, and, and see what that means? Um, and then, of course, uh, the, as Eric and, and several others have, have already mentioned, we have a lot of work to do in terms of um, transition planning for uh, OpenFlow 1.3, uh, next generations of hardware uh, deployed in all of these places as part of the Gini infrastructure. Um, and that's a big part of what we're, what we're working on, as well as continuing what, what we've been doing in our project around working on uh, really what does it mean to define partnerships with uh, uh, you know, industry partners in particular uh, and bring value so that they, that they will want to work with Genie and invest in Genie. So, uh, and we'll both be at poster and demos tonight, so come talk to us more about all these projects. Great. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, to everyone who spoke. Thanks for keeping it short. Please send me your slides uh, so we can post them. And don't forget to drink water. Okay, one, one minute before we, before we head over for lunch. So I, I want to apologize a little bit for the inside baseball nature of some of these presentations. Things came fast and furious, and there are a lot of details. Uh, there are a lot of details that we need you know, to keep in place. But the, the overall message that I hope people are taking away here is that you know, Genie's gone a long way in becoming a coherent, useful test bed. And we're now putting in place the underlayment that's required to make sure that it continues in that mode for years into the future. Um, you saw some you know, stunning examples of, of really cool research that, that seemed easy, but it wasn't easy either to do the research or to support it. And this is the kind of stuff that just wasn't happening a couple, three years ago. And you, know, you saw maybe six out of the 6,500 uh, people who are using Genie. Now, these are particularly good ones, you know, I, I grant you, but there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. And then let me leave you with, with wisdom from reminders of wisdom from two people. Um, the first was uh, Jim Carosa, who said, you know, it is our collective responsibility to carry this forward. So you know, keep that in mind for the next uh, day or so as you participate in the sessions where we help to uh, design what Jeannie's doing next. And the um, second bit of wisdom is uh, please drink the water. Okay, so we're, we're going to lunch now. Thanks very much.